So when I was younger and someone would ask me, what is the meaning of life? And, you know, that sort of always seemed to come up, that question. I was just kind of party animal I was, I guess. And um, anyway, I would answer 42 is the meaning of life. And the, yeah, okay. So those who were among me when I said this, who had read Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, would maybe go woohoo or would smile wryly knowing the inside joke. Uh, while others who had not read the book just thought I was like being obnoxious and I usually would not get invited back to that person's house again. So, so by the way, how many people you have ever read uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide? A few, a number of you, good. But for those who didn't, in, in the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, an alien race created a supercomputer named Deep Thought to answer the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And after seven and a half million years, Deep Thought determined that the answer was 42. And of course, this was incomprehensible to everybody, and thus that the joke. However, the alien race then commissioned Deep Thought to create another computer to help the aliens understand the question that gives context to the answer 42. And so Deep Thought created the planet Earth as a supercomputer to find that question. Now, wouldn't that put an interesting twist on the theory of evolution or creation? <laughs> the beginning of the book starts 10, millions a 10 million years after the computer uh, started trying to find the question. And there are about five more minutes to go before completion. And the protagonist of the book, a human named Arthur Dent, is laying down in front of bulldozers uh, trying to prevent his house from being bulldozed. And he's willing to sacrifice himself to protect what he feels is his. And then his friend, who is a disguised alien, saves him because right before the supercomputer Earth is supposed to give the question to the answer, the Earth is destroyed by other aliens trying to make way for something called a hyperspace bypass. Right. It is a science fiction book. I mean, you have to take it for what it is. But there are just so many interesting questions to think about from that story, for me anyway. It shows me that the quality of the questions that we ask will determine the quality of the answers that we receive. As an example, in my congregation, uh, we often and have been talking about growth. And just as a funny aside, you should know, you know any time our congregation, you should be honored by this, any time our congregation is, is asking a question, they always say, well, what does Des Moines do? You know? <laughs> So you should be proud that you're an exemplar, uh, somebody that we look to uh, for wisdom. So um, anyway, often when we're talking about growth, somebody asks the question, well, why do we want to grow? And I always say to them, I think, you know, the better question to ask is that if we believe Unitarian Universalism has an important religious message, if our experiences here in community have been positive, why would we not want to share that with our friends or the rest of the community? Changing the question to make its context more clear helps guide people to better answers and as well to better actions. You know, sometimes finding an answer also requires patience. Now, seven and a half million years may be a long time, but think about seven million years in the scope of the billions of years of evolution that we've had. Have we gained greater understanding of our humanity, our world, our universe in the past seven million years? Sometimes I think we, we're always, we're, we're trained to think in short term. We sometimes need to take the longer view and see how things can work out. I mean, it's only been a thousand years since we found out that the world wasn't flat. Imagine what we will find out in the next thousand years, not necessarily the next six months, right? Imagine, imagine. 
And truly, sometimes in life, the answers that we find will not be satisfactory. And we will have to start again. It is in that moment, that moment of realization that our lives are shaped. When we have fallen, when we have been fragmented, when we have realized our fallacy, in that moment, we are defined as individuals and as a species. And that continues on despite our failures, even, even with the uncertainty and with the hope of a better outcome, even if not in our lifetime. But even so, we continue on to bend the arc of the universe ever so slowly over time. And sometimes awareness takes time. Sometimes events in one's lives intersect with each other that open up that gateway to awareness. And we just have to be aware and open to those connections when they happen. Now, the writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, who has since passed away, in numerous interviews says that he just made up the number 42, that it really meant nothing at all. There's nothing significant about it. And I, and, and I read just about every interview with him because <laughs> I was really curious about the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Um, However, th this summer, as I was contemplating the meaning of life, as I often do, I happened to watch a movie based on the life of Jackie Robinson entitled 42. And I immediately made the connection that somehow Jackie Robinson and baseball have held the context to the ultimate answer of life and the universe. Now first, Baseball is a very sublime game that has many, many parallels to life. The season starts in spring when we emerge from the cold of winter to the warmth of sunshine, when the flowers start to bloom and the leaves reappear on the trees, and everything that was old seems new again. The season ends in the fall just as the leaves are starting to fall off the trees. And I remember it as if it was yesterday, as a young boy, the first time I walked out of the concrete walkways and saw those bright green grass of Shea Stadium in New York City. Living in the, amongst concrete, it just seemed like the Garden of Eden when I, when I walked out onto that field. And I grew up during an age of innocence before steroids and the New York Mets were the underdog and their relief pitcher, Tug McGraw, who, if you didn't know, is the father of country singer Tim McGraw. And, and I, I didn't know that uh, until recently. And so Tug McGraw would shout, you got to believe, as the rallying cry for the team. And back then I said it was a time of innocence and I didn't ask, well, why should I believe? What proof do you have that I should believe? No, I, I just believed. And... For a couple of summers, at least, that belief was rewarded. But life, like baseball, is full of hope and belief, and as well, disappointments. I, I look especially to you Chicago Cub fans to basically understand that. <laughs> Yet each year at the beginning of the year, hope always springs eternal. And as I have gotten older, after many, many losing seasons and a deep Buddhist meditation practice, I've learned not to become attached to outcomes. And I just sit and I just enjoy the game for the game itself. It's pace, slower than most sports and slower than most of our lives, actually, I would say. A reminder for us to slow down in this, face past, in this, fa this fast-paced world of, of life and action sports. A reminder to notice those blades of grass and sunshine, and as well to learn patience with each pitch, the innings, to see how the game would turn out. Like life, finding the answer to life, the game of baseball requires patience. Sometimes a lot of patience. In fact, 
the game could potentially never end like eternity. That's true. It can go on and on until it reaches a conclusion, until the ending is decided. Like life, baseball is filled with failure. In fact, the best players fail 70% of the time. And just as we as a species continue on despite our failures, so do baseball players. And so does baseball even after the designated hitter rule. <laughs> Not to claim a bias, I have accepted it. I, acceptance is another thing that we learn with baseball, that we don't control all the events of life. So I just have accepted the American League uses the designated hitter. Like life and like a worship service as well, baseball is filled with both certainty and uncertainty. Each stadium has both symmetry and asymmetry built within its design. The infield diamond with the four bases are the same in every stadium. Yet the outfield in every stadium has different dimensions, shapes. And like life and a worship service, some stay the same and some things change. Now the goal in baseball is for the players who are batting, think about this, to get home. And ultimately, isn't that what we all want to do? To find our way home, to find our way back to the beginning, back to our best selves when we started, to shed off the dust of life that covers us after being in the dirt for too long. But before going home, a player must first go from first to second to third. Life like that is a journey as well, to find our way home. Some go from first to home very quickly via hitting a home run. Like life, some people are just naturally gifted at certain things. They can do it themselves with raw will and power, but that really is the rare few. Like baseball, most of us have to scratch our way all the way home, maybe hitting a single, stealing a base, uh, going throughout all the bases, for maybe being... Uh, being able to score on a sacrifice fly. Sacrifice. So I want you to think about that. The first time I ever heard of the word sacrifice was not in a church, but at a baseball game. And that, that is true. When the batter sacrifices their chance to journey around the bases to help another player to get home, just like in life. Some things we can do on our own, but often most things we need help from others. Sometimes we have to sacrifice things ourselves so others can succeed. Or others sacrifice so we can succeed. And in the end comes the realization that none of us, none of us can do it alone. We need each other. Now, Jackie Robinson, whose uniform bore the number 42, was a, the first African-American uh, to play the, in Major League Baseball, uh, and that occurred in 1947. And as kind of said, we never talk about Larry Doby, who uh, was the second African-American baseball player in the Major Leagues, and he was a great player in his own right, and he started only about two months after Jackie Robinson, but there is something about being first, to taking that risk, to being that trailblazer. And that is what often we are called to do as a liberal religion, to be out front. I saw your Black Lives Matter sign uh, on as I drove in here. And we were the first for years uh, to recognize also as well the BGLQT community while, and supported them and was out front and them. There will be something else. There's always something that we need to be out for. That is what makes us a liberal religious community. That is what makes us a relevant religious community. But I want to talk about Jackie Robinson being the first, being able to risk. Because more than being a skilled player, he was determined and persistent. And I think his greatest skill that he had was his ability to remain calm in the midst of a storm. And despite an onslaught of constant taunts and violence and discrimination, Robinson did not respond with violence or viciousness. 
And more importantly, Robinson was able to maintain the high quality of his play throughout it all. And Robinson has said he, he was able to do this because he had the support of his family, the ownership of the team, his manager, and many of his teammates. But he was the one who had to go out day in and day out and deal with the challenges that you and I cannot imagine. What can we learn from Jackie Robinson? How do we face the challenges of our day? How do we maintain the calm in the midst of our storms? And so first, I think, and looking at Jackie Robinson, we have to be as excellent as we can in the things that we do. We need to maintain our internal integrity, always knowing who we are and what our values are. We need to risk failing, and if we do, to trying new things when that happens. Do not let fear overcome the risk of trying something new. We need to be willing to sacrifice some of our own personal desires for the greater good of something larger than ourselves. But most of all, we need to be engaged. We need to participate with our best selves at the highest levels to have the largest impact with those that we connect with. If Jackie Robinson had reacted violently to those who taunted him instead of showing the dignity that he did, the future of integration of baseball and maybe integration in this entire country may have taken on a different course. It is said the Dodgers' opponents, excessive vitriol against Robinson, united the Dodgers to support Robinson in ways they otherwise never could have happened. He changed how many people in this country thought about race. By his demeanor and his actions, he won the respect of his teammates and the country. And this episode, this episode in our history also shows, I think, how white people can be allies to people of color as well, to use their power to affect social change for all. And although Brooklyn's ownership motives to hire Robinson may have in some part been economic, it was still a risk. But a risk that can lead to justice is a risk worth taking. And so I ask you, what are you willing to risk? What old arguments or old failures or old ways of doing things are you willing to put aside for the greater good? the greater good of yourself, your family, for the greater good of this congregation, for the greater good of the larger community. In all your actions, I ask you to consider how you are impacting other people's lives for the better. How can you participate to make this community the best it can be? so that it can affect transformative change in people's lives and in the lives of others in Des Moines. What are your unique skills? What are your passions in this world? And how can you combine your skills and your passions to live out your values in the world? As the song we heard earlier said, put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Get involved. You know, a Gallup poll showed that a large percentage of members of congregations wanted to be involved, but they've never been asked, so they don't know how to get involved. So you don't need to be shy. That's my first, another, another don't be shy. You have many possibilities to get engaged and to be involved here, and you can just ask your ministers, your leaders, each other, and just find ways to get connected and to connect. Trust me, it will add deeply to your lives. And so you have to ask yourselves, are you going to be like Arthur Dent, worrying about his house when the planet is being destroyed? Or let us now use our knowledge instead, and our awareness of the universe to shape the future before others shape it for us. 
So let us look at the big picture and what is best for the whole. And if we do that, if we do what is best for the whole, we will make ourselves whole. And by finding wholeness, we will find ourselves safe at home. May it be so.